Welcome back to Fourth and Forever. I'm your host, Mark Sanchez. We have to do things once again a little different. I, I'm getting these notes from producers. They're telling me we got to target this young audience. You know, you got to use social media, you got to crowdsource, groupthink some of these questions. So listen, I dove deep into my face and Spacebook. We got Mark Heasley, one of my favorite Trojans of all time, former wide receiver there, former Jacksonville Jaguar, current New England Patriot with a small asterisk, and we'll get into that. Mark Heasley, thank you for joining the show. No problem, no problem. I appreciate you and having me on the show. All right, so like we said, we're gonna crowdsource some of this stuff. Uh, the first question comes from at SNC Stephanie. I don't know what the SNC stands for, but thank you for your question. Best USC wide receiver of all time, other than you, yourself, Marquise Lee, who is it? It had to be Robert Woods for me. That's the receiver I looked up to before I even got into football. That was one name that I constantly kept hearing on my side of town. And actually, when I got the chance to see him and, and keep up with him as I do still today, it's been going crazy. And I feel like everything that I've done, if I can call myself the best, one of the best, he's done. Um, so therefore, he's one of the best, too. Very good. I love that answer. And then next question from all you young um, social media users. At M-A-R underscore S-C underscore Ella. I'm assuming her name's Morella. I have no idea. Uh, but we're probably best friends virtually now. And the question is, where do you see yourself in 2021, they're just jumping the gun here, but let's just get to 2021 right now. 2020 has been a disaster. Where are you, Marquise Lee, going to be in 2021? In 2021, hopefully I'm back with the packs and, and this pandemic is gone. Um, um, but that's, that's where I'll be. Hopefully I'm in, in Fox Barrel and I'm getting ready to play um, for the packs that season. Um, that's my plan for next for the 2021 season. Well, I think Patriots Nation's happy to hear that. Okay, these three questions I came up with. <laughs> The USC quarterback you wish you would have played with. Who Mark. Mark. <laughs> that was a slam dunk. Okay. Other than me, <laughs> one of your favorite USC quarterbacks to watch. Was it Carson? Was it Liner? Was it Rodney Pete? Who would you like to play with? Obviously all of them, but who, if you had to pick one? They got to be out of Carson or Liner. Yeah, right? Yeah, I had to be Carson Liner. I don't know. Honestly, it'd probably be Carson. From what I've seen, you from saying, like, just the previous film, he was a baller. Not saying Liner wasn't either, but um, um, just the opportunity to go out there and play with him would be, be, be crazy for me. That'd be fun. Um, okay, best, best teammate you've ever played with. You can't use Robert Woods again. All uh, right. Either at Sarah at USC or in the NFL, your favorite teammate? I ain't knocking nobody. I got a lot of favorite teammates, but I'm going to go uh, I'm gonna go in the NFL. One of my closest and favorite teammates was Alan Hearns, who previously now played for the Miami Dolphins. Our relationship kicked off. We both got drafted, and he was actually undrafted when I got to Jacksonville, but he's been playing for numerous amount of years, been going crazy, but um, we kicked it off, had a crazy relationship. Same typical backgrounds and things like that, and um, as far as what we see and what we think about as far as our future and things like that, we're kind of on a similar plate. So um, we check in each other here and there pretty much like every day in all honesty. He's having a, a kid coming up and things like that. So I'm eager to, to uh, help him through that fatherhood since I just started my fatherhood and things like that. So um, Alan Hearns, honestly. That's great. And then last one from this opening first down blitz. Hardest Defensive back, the toughest, the best defensive back you faced in the NFL. Who is it? <laughs> it was my teammate, uh, the hardest defensive back, Jalen Ramsey, man. Oh, that's right. Besides Jalen Ramsey, A.J. Bouye. Really? Yeah, A.J. Bouye yeah. is a great corner. I'm not going to lie to you guys. Both of them have different techniques, but both of them was great. In all honesty, I know Jalen, don't get me wrong, top top corner in the league, but A.J. Bouye is up there, too. What makes Jalen Ramsey so good, other than his physical <laughs> attributes? So his, his ball skills are incredible. He's got speed. He's got size. But what is it? What's, what about Jalen Ramsey makes him so good? It's confidence. Regardless of who he's going against, he's out there, and he's he knows at the end of the day, regardless of who you are, Julio, Odell, me, tight ends, it don't matter, running backs. I mean, his mentality is at the end of the day, I'm going to find a way to get that ball out. If not, 
pick it off. Then if not, I'm going to knock yeah. you out. A lot of people think he just that type of corner that's out there just going to pick things off. No, nah, he'll come down and hit you too. I love it. He seems like the kind of guy, I mean, there's certain guys that you play with or play against that just have a dog inside of them. A lot like the Jordan documentary where he's like, I don't just want to beat you. I just want to embarrass your ass. I want to embarrass <laughs> you on national TV, in front of your family. I understand. He could come off. He could come off that way. He don't put no mouthpiece in. So what you think he doing? <laughs> <laughs> you know he's so talking you his he ass doing? off. I love he's talking crazy, but he confident he's going to back it up, so you can't blame him. I love it. Let's go to some of your early years, your formative years, your growing up with, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but two parents who are deaf, and so you got to learn sign language. Take us through some of those struggles and that kind of communication. Can you say something to us? Can you say good morning to us? Can you say anything in sign language for us? My mom and my dad is fully deaf. Can't speak at all. Um, growing up, it was tough, in all honesty. To this, to, to this day, honestly, it's kind of tough. Uh, I learned just to accept it and try to put my mom in the sense of everybody at the end of the day. I got, I got cousins who's in wheelchairs and things like that, but my cousin move as good as us, Mark. If not good as us, I'm talking about travel more than us. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So when I look at him and things like that, I can't put my mom in a situation where I can let her feel sorry or people feel sorry for herself, you know what I'm saying? Or my dad feels sorry for themselves, you know what I'm saying? Like, so I try to get out of that situation because it's always tough seeing people, I mean, kids, you know what I'm saying? Growing up, having full conversations with your mom and dad, you know what I'm saying? Yelling at your mom and dad, hearing your mom yelling, dad, I ain't never heard my mom yell at me once. One of the things I think about is like, I'm sure they came to see your games, of course, at USC. Yeah. And I mean, you know what happens when you score a touchdown. You're you hear the band. What was that like? I mean, after games, they had to be so proud of you. And then to quickly communicate in sign language, what was that like? I mean, my biggest thing for my mom and my pops, uh, even my, I didn't really talk to my pops too much, but for when, for, to have him understand was, okay, what, what, what was going on? When I caught the ball and I actually scored, what happened? You know what I'm saying? Well, how many points we got and things like that. Like I had to sit down and explain to my mom things like that. So for her, she didn't need to hear the band. You feel what I'm right. saying? She didn't, she didn't need to hear anybody screaming because at the end of the day, she knew that she was screaming for me and she knew what was going on once I explained. After the games, it was always stoked. Have an opportunity to go back home and just see my mom just saying, oh, you did, oh, you did good. You had a good game. Awesome. You did great. You know what I'm saying? You did good. To wake up to the next morning, you know what I'm saying? Just thinking, just seeing our text saying like, you know what I'm saying? And the thing about... The people in the deaf community, in all honesty, that I can to give y'all a little bit of insight is they don't text like us. You know what I'm saying? The communication mm. is a lot different. You feel what I'm saying? Because when you're dealing with sign language, like I'm, I'm going to the store, like in sign language, you're eliminating, like I'm going. It's just me, go to the store. Oh. You know what I'm saying? So we're not. So we're the not, texts come through like that. So sometimes my mom hit me and was like, okay, like, like, like instead of say what are you do like what are you doing she hit me with the what doing oh wow I never would have known that you found huh. something like what are you doing and I gotta yeah. add stuff in myself like dang and I've been telling my mom like hey stop texting like that you know what I'm saying like it's too <laughs> much for you like you gotta you gotta put everything in there so oh I'm sorry and things like that but <laughs> you get caught up you know what I'm saying it's crazy but yeah. you learn to adjust you know what I'm saying that 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 was the extra chip on my shoulder not me being able to enjoy to talk to my mom and them and things like that but me having that capability to have my mom enjoy the experience that everybody else who you know what I'm saying, who she feel that's talking out there uh, can experience. Wow, that's beautiful. That's beautiful you did that. Um, but grew up here in Inglewood, Southern California. You played with Woods, and did you play with George Farmer and, and P. Rich all through, like, growing <laughs> up and stuff, like Little League and all that? Yeah, so, nah. So that's I a knew super P. team, bro. That's, that's messed up. Uh, it's crazy. I ain't gonna lie to you. I've been were, were you on the Inglewood, you were on the Inglewood football team? Yes. Chop, chop wood. Oh, you're crazy for that. Knock it off. <laughs> <laughs> you're crazy for that. Eagle wood up to no good. Bro, it's I remember playing you guys, getting our asses whooped. Not yeah, your we, specific team, but teams from Inglewood. Right. They were tough. They had some dogs on there. I ain't going to lie to you. Just they couldn't stay out of trouble. You know what I'm saying? That's, <laughs> that's the only thing was about the Inglewood teams. But uh, I got the opportunity to play with all those guys. Um, Robert Woods, the George Farmer, when I got to high school. 
um, my sophomore year to Sarah. Then uh, I actually knew Paul Richardson prior to that. Never went to the same school with him. But I knew him when we was younger, um, running around middle school and things like that. Um, but then we all ended up at Sarah. And at that time, honestly, wow. I wasn't even playing. I wasn't even playing receiver. I was playing safety, and Paul Richardson, George Farmer, and uh, Robert was playing all receivers. Dang. So then, I mean, you talked about there was so much trouble, gang activity, all that kind of stuff going on around you just based on where you grew up. That was just circumstantial. What kept you out of that? What kept you pushing forward? Was it sports? Was it your parents? Was it a combination? I mean, what kept you on the right path? to get where you are today? It's always tough, but it took a tragedy in order for me to get, to really get on point. Um, in and out, messing with the gang stuff, running around with my brothers and things like that. Um, it didn't really took it to my brother passing away for me to really, hmm. you know what I'm saying, lock down and really focus on what I needed to do. Once my brother passed, I literally just had a conversation with myself. Um, it, was a, it was in a position where I kept seeing my mom cry. You know what I'm saying? I see my mom in the corner crying after my brother passed away. And uh, I just took myself to a point to where I just had a conversation with myself. Like, all right, regardless of all the stuff that you've been through, like, where do you go from here? Are you going to continue to have your mom crying every night, every weekend, you feel what I'm saying? Until she's miserable, until she passed away type stuff? Or you going to kick rocks, get it right, you feel what I'm saying? Change your path and find something that you can focus on. So mm -hmm. the outlet was honestly just sports. You know what I'm saying? That was the easiest thing that was accessible at that point for me in the sense of not having to come up with anything financially. So uh, first sport I played was soccer. Then once I started playing soccer <laughs> and I realized, like, I can run around, I can go, then I was like, all right, let's change sports and see how it goes. And I ended up starting playing football and basketball and it just panning out in all honesty. And that was my just escape goat as far as stress and, and when I was worried and, when I stand at hotels and motels, you found Sam like once I got to practice, I felt like at the end of the day I was at where I needed to be. That's great. That sounds like sports kind of gave you freedom, gave you direction, really was the rudder of your ship. So then you get all this interest as a as a top high school athlete and a football player, obviously, but why USC? <laughs> Honestly, I ain't gonna lie to you guys right now. I wanted to leave. I wanted to get out of really? California. I swear. I wanted to get For out real? of California. Where'd you want to go? Uh, honestly, I wanted to go to Miami. Can't lie to you. You can ask George Farmer to this day. I was trying to get him to leave Cali too. Just to get out. I don't think it was necessarily me really caring about the school and things like that. I just, I, I just wanted to get far away from California as far as I can. You know what I'm saying? And just enjoy something different. You know yeah, I'm saying, but when it came down to me making that decision, it was just a little bit of reality set in. You know, I got a younger sister. Um, we both was in foster care and things like that. So at that time, when I had to sit down with her and had the conversation about me going off to Miami, her thing was she didn't want me to go too far to where something happened to her. I couldn't get back to. So that kind of well, swayed on my decision yeah. on standing on the. The West Coast. So when I say the West Coast, it was just like UCLA or SC. And then it was like, okay, well, you know how that decision went. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course I, I did. was like, I'm not a UCLA fan. You know what I'm saying? Then on top of that, yeah. in all honesty, that's when Robert Woods and George Farmer was going to SC. Then everybody got a mix of me playing receiver. Then I caught a lot of wind of, okay, you wouldn't play over there because you got players who are already going to be playing. So I put a little chip on my shoulder coming out of high school like, well, I guess that's the decision I'm going to make and go there and we're going to see if I'm a player or not. Then you're at USC. You're playing as a true freshman alongside your high school teammates, Robert Woods. Then your sophomore year is where things just blow up. I mean... Mm -hmm. You're the best receiver in college football, Bolitnikoff winner, unanimous All-American. What was it like to be recognized like that as a top wide receiver in college football when just, you know, a few years earlier, you're talking about playing soccer, you lose your brother, you're thinking about going to Miami, you stay home for your sister. I mean, what, all those emotions and the culmination of so much hard work, how did that feel <laughs> getting that award? It was crazy. I'm not going to lie to you because... Even to this day, if you'd ask me, like, do you think you'd have been a receiver you was going to be, you know what I'm saying, as far as coming out of college, I, I would have told you no. My first start going to SC was going to play defense. <laughs> Coach Polar <laughs> told me I was going to play corner. 
You know what I'm saying? Then yeah. that's when Coach Kiffin was like, oh, we're going to see how you do at receiver. And then if you want to go back to corner, we'll figure it out. Then we just start rocking after that. And everything panned out. So it's like, it was crazy. You know, and honestly, like, I sat down at a point after I won the award and seen, like, okay, do you really deserve it? In the sense of, like, all right, did you really put the work in? And and as I look back at the film and did everything, it was like, dang, I really did deserve it. And at that time, it was still surprising. And to this day, I still look back like it's crazy, like just to win that award. You know what I'm saying? Especially playing with the people that you've been playing with as far as college, like Stedman Bailey. You know what I'm saying? Like Tavon Austin. You know what I'm saying? Those are the years that those guys are there and things like that. Like those are great receivers. You know what I'm saying? Especially going crazy as far as college goes. Like their numbers are insane. And just for me to be able to be up there in that caliber and always be talked about, like, one thing about SC that I can always say is I want to blend a cough. And that etches you in USC history, man. That's that's a special place. That's the best thing I can ever say. Like, one thing that everybody said, what's the biggest thing and attribute, you know what I'm saying? Besides having my mom see me walk across that stage and you know, getting drafted, I made history when nobody and nobody on my side, as far as the young people, really believed in me actually making it until I actually got it done. Your freshman year at USC, you guys are still, they took away some scholarships and you're still ineligible to participate in a bowl game. Now, looking at the college landscape, they've changed so much. Now you can profit off your name, your image, your likeness. I mean, these players, it looks like they're going to get money from these TV contracts. That's got to piss you off a little bit. I mean, do it? What's that all about? Heck yeah, that got me hot. I'm not gonna lie to you, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's insane. And and it's nothing to really, I don't, I'm not even a big firm believer on speaking on it, but it's just, it's just crazy. It's the same thing that we've been talking about for a long time, you know what I'm saying? As far as college players been, shouldn't be getting things for, for the things they've been doing. But, you know what I'm saying? They're starting to see now, like, okay, at the end of the day, you getting some, getting paid for your thing doesn't change how you're going out there to play. <laughs> you feel what I'm right. saying? If you're good and you're going out there and killing it, you're going to go kill it regardless if you're getting paid or not. You feel what I'm saying? Like, I wish I was getting paid in college. You feel what I'm saying? I wish I was in college at this time where I knew things was going to get paid. If I was going to get paid on my stuff, you tell me, I got get to, I could get paid now. Then I could get paid when I get to the NFL too. You feel what I'm saying? Like, that's lit. But when we was in college, it was insane. You know how many offers <laughs> that we, how many, how many people we was bringing in while everybody else was bringing in like 30 people? We was bringing in like 12. Yeah. 12 a year. You feel what I'm saying? We couldn't, we barely had enough to stack our team. You feel what I'm saying? Let alone you want us to go out there and go crazy. You know what I'm saying? Somebody get injured. You feel what I'm saying? We ain't got the numbers to back it up. Right. You know what I'm saying? It was insane at that time. I can't even lie to you. So I'm happy. Now I'm excited for the college players nowadays and going forward as far as getting paid and getting, you know what I'm saying? What they need at this point. You feel what I'm saying? Like, you know, like in college, Regardless of us being college doing what we're supposed to do, you feel what I'm saying? We were still living rough. No still doubt. getting our stipends to try to get our rents. You feel what I'm saying? Like, it was still rough. Still <laughs> had to ask your parents for a couple hundred dollars. Like, it shouldn't be like that. Now it ain't got to be like that, and, and I applaud it. Talk about your transition to the NFL. You go to the Jaguars. You finally make it to Florida. You wanted to get away from home. It finally happens. And there you are in Jacksonville, one-on-ones, Jalen Ramsey. You know, talk about <laughs> your... Rookie year and that transition, what uh, what was one of your favorite parts, maybe your highest moment, and then your lowest moment as a rookie? The transition was crazy. Getting drafted to Jacksonville, I wasn't a real sports person like that, like paying attention to the teams like that, so I didn't really know what Jacksonville was. You know what I'm saying? So I got drafted. Came alive to you. So when I got drafted, I was stoked, though. Once I got there, I seen the scenery and how different it was. When I was eager to just experience it. You know what I'm saying? I've been in California all my life. You feel what I'm saying? Now I get the chance to get on the total other side of the world and actually enjoy, you know what I'm saying, a different lifestyle. It was actually great. But it had a lot of highs and lows. You feel what I'm saying? I went into Jacksonville during a time where it was our roughest, where we trying to find our identity and figure ourselves out as as a team and as a, an organization. Um, um, so th- one of the lows was just really experiencing how an NFL season can really go. Really going 2-14, and 14, like, type stuff. You know what I'm saying? It's a like, long year, bro. It's a like, long year. 
that's a crazy year to even though I'm not saying we had our craziest years at SC and things like that, but I can one thing I say, we always been above 50 when I was there. You feel what I'm saying? So I always felt like, yeah, we lost, but we wasn't that bad. Like I was two and fourteen. And there was nothing you can do. You feel what I'm saying? You going out there, you seeing people, like there was nothing you can do. So you know what I'm saying that was one of the lows, but then uh one of the highs just somebody put in my position and letting me know like you control what you can control. And that's, and that's really basically it. He was like, there's nothing else than that. He was like, regardless of what's going on with this team, you feel what I'm saying? The way you go about your day and the way you prepare and the way, you know what I'm saying, you, you handle the things you need to handle will protect the sense of you and doing what you're supposed to do for the team. Yeah. You feel what I'm saying? And I started that's thinking like, hey, what does that mean? And you know what I'm saying? And, and that put me in the sense of, okay, now I changed my mentality for the next couple of years to where it's like, all right, well, I'm going to control where I can control. You know what I'm saying? And I feel like I got better in, and not only in the football aspects, but blocking. You feel what I'm saying? Like, I knew at the end of the day, you feel what I'm saying? I can control that. You feel what I'm saying? So let me <laughs> let me put a little bit more effort and energy into blocking and running my routes a little bit longer or putting that extra work in and things like that. Because I feel like after my first year, I got into a slump to where I was comfortable with what was going on in Jackson. And it took us a while before we got out of that slump, but we ended up getting out of it. So you perform well. It sounds like early on on teams that weren't as good, all you can do as a player is hone in on your craft, make yourself the best version of yourself that you possibly can. And clearly you did that because they pay you in your second contract. <laughs> First thing you bought with your second contract money, don't lie to me, what'd you get? <laughs> I know you didn't send me anything, so you must have got somebody something nice. Oh no! In all honesty, I bought myself something on my first contract. Uh, you I get? got a car. I got a car. What kind of car? I got a Bentley. Yeah, you did. I got a what Bentley kind? truck. Give me, a every, white give me all the details, uh, man. Oh, uh, I got a, a Bentayga, the Bentley truck. Um, it's just white with black and white insides. I still have it. It has like my prized possession. Um, <laughs> I end up, I ain't gonna lie to you. I know it's lost value as soon as I bought it. Yeah, I understand the depreciation of cars very well. <laughs> but um, one thing for me was, as a kid, I always remember sitting on the bricks of my foster parents' house, um, Maria and Armando Flores. I, I promise you, always sitting on the bricks. And I used to see like 745s and 750s, like BMWs passing by. And at the end of the day, I told myself like, dude, one day I'm gonna get a car. You know what I'm saying? I would get a like, car, and it's going to be the one I really want. So once I got paid, I was like, okay, well, I ended up buying, um, I ended up having a Hellcat, too. You feel what I'm saying? So I, I had that for my first four years. Then um, then the Bentley came up, and then I was like, you know what? So I went to go talk to my mom. Like, hey, mom, the Bentley, you know what I'm saying? And I was like, it's kind of expensive, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's kind of crazy, but she was like, well, do you really want it? And I was like, how many people you know from Inglewood got a Bentley? <laughs> You're right. She, she was you're like, right. you're right. That's exactly what she said. You're right. You're right. So I was like, you know what? I was going to get it. So I plan on having my dad building for a while. In all honesty, I don't never plan on getting rid of it. It's been here since I got it. I plan on having it for, for a while until my daughter at least get older and head to college and take it or whatever she got to do with it. Is she going to ride around in the Bentley for her first car? No. What do you mean? <laughs> Hell uh, no. <laughs> Hell no. I didn't ride around the bend in my first car. No. She ride around whatever we got. Some simple. Keep her no humble. Way. Keep her humble. Yeah, yeah nah, very good. Very sure. smart. My daughter, my daughter going to be for sure humble at the end of the day. That's great. What about your decision this year? I know COVID has taken over the globe and specifically the NFL as it relates to you. What went into that decision? I know your daughter had a huge factor in that. What was the conversation like with the Patriots? Because, you know, you go from Jacksonville to New England, COVID hits, boom, and you got to make a decision with this young new life and new fatherhood that you've landed in. What's going through your mind? How did that conversation go? And, and uh, you know, ultimately, what was the reason for the opt-out? 2020 has been insane. I'm not going to lie to you. And this, this pandemic is... It's easy when they're saying it, you know what I'm saying? Like, it was a lot that go went along with my decision as far as um, opting out this year. It took me months, you know what I'm saying? I don't know if people really understand, like, we're not just out here just opting out, you know what I'm saying? Just because, like, it's really taking a, a decision and a man's decision, you know what I'm saying? Especially for a 
for me. You know what I'm saying? I can't speak for everybody else because everybody got their own opinion and decision on why they did what they did and things like that. But as far as for me, you know what I'm saying? It was a lot of pressure due to the fact that opportunity, you know what I'm saying? You now in New England, they got Cam, you know what I'm saying? Stittles, Hoyer, it don't matter who you go with. You know that what the New England Patriots do as an organization, you know what I'm saying? So your opportunity from where you, where you been to where you at now, and things like that, like that plays a factor. Family members play the factor, you know what I'm saying? All that pressure. But at the end of the day, it just became the decision of, you know what I'm saying? What did I feel what was important at this time? And me sitting down with my significant other and what she felt like was important at this time. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. my biggest decision was my child, don't get me wrong, but my girl mom have issues as far as lung issues and things like that. And I'm not going to keep her away from, you know what I'm saying, her grandchild due to the fact that I'm just trying to go out there and just play. You know what I'm saying? Because right. I know what I got this year and things like that. Like, And then at the end of the day, like, yeah, it's the pandemic going. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, we're trying to stay safe in the NFL, but at the end of the day, you don't know. You just don't know. And for me, playing that game of uh, you don't know with my baby's life wasn't an option for me. Did growing up in the foster care system, not having, you know, like a set of parents around, like, regularly jumping from house to house, all that kind of stuff, everything you've lived through, did that play into this at all? That was major for me. You know what I'm saying? You got to understand the people that I have in my life that I consider fathers, you know what I'm saying, are mentors. Or, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, my foster care fathers that I ran across, you know what I'm saying, which I don't fault them at all because they still love me. But at the end of the day, you know, that's not my father. And my dad is actually around and I don't talk to him, you know what I'm saying? So as me, as a father now, you know what I'm saying, I told myself, there's no way I'm missing any time with my daughter. You know what I'm saying? So at the time, you know what I'm saying, my mom mentioned or my, a couple of my friends mentioned, like, hey, you can make the sacrifice of leaving your family here and you going and, you know what I'm saying, and figuring that out. But at the end of the day, it was like, for me, like, that's not a sacrifice I'm willing to make. For me, you know what I'm saying? Like, I got a daughter and I've been there with my girl all nine months. You know what I'm saying? I've been here with my daughter since she was been born and I plan on being here every day after that. You feel what I'm saying? So therefore, like, when that decision came up, it was like, what's important? I told Coach in all honesty, I have a conversation with Coach Belichick and I just let him know, like, at the end of the day, like, I wouldn't feel comfortable as a man going out there and you expected me to give 100%. You know what I'm saying? And I can't give you 100% when I know I'm going to be worried about, you know what I'm saying, what's going on at the crib and my girl worrying about her situation or me worrying about this, their situation. And when I need to be worrying about what coverage they're in and what, what release I got to do in order to beat them. I'm doing you a disservice. Yeah. So at the end of the day, I didn't want to go out there and, and put no bad film, do them a disservice, or even get hurt at the end of the day while focusing on something else when I should be focusing on football. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. I, I commend you and your decision. What did Coach Belichick say in response? He gave a lot of positivity, in all honesty. He he just mentioned at the end of the day, like, he got kids, so he understands. He was like, and, and at right now in this position, he ain't in the position to make a decision because his kids is already old, so he's not in that position. So, therefore, he understands. He said he commended me as a man, you know what I'm saying, for making a, that decision for my family and to see me 2021. Clearly, the most responsible team will be the most successful this year, meaning the team that's, you know, goes about uh, going straight home, you know, m creating a virtual ecosystem, if you will, and eliminating any external factors and variables. So you think in those locker rooms, uh, or if you've talked to anybody about what certain guys do as opposed to don't do, how do you think that plays a role in this season? It's just one more thing, I feel like, in the locker room that people have to get ironed out, you know? Not to mention the racial injustice stuff. I mean, there's a lot of issues on the table right now this season. I mean, your take on what those conversations might be like in the locker room. You know how the locker room goes. I feel like at this point, with, even with all these things that's going on, I feel like the locker room is the best place for us as a point as far as the camaraderie and having those conversations. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, you got a bunch of men in there who understands, who's been around fighting for each other. So at the end of the day, we feel like we can sit down and have that conversation with each other. Yeah. 
You know what I'm saying? So I feel like the conversation that's going on right now, that's 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 going on in the locker room, just getting egged out. I feel like players is probably coming a lot closer together, in all honesty, you know what I'm saying, due to the fact of all the crazy things that went on in 2020 anyway. At the end of the day, they understand, well, it's either we allow the crazy stuff to continue going on or we find a way, to, you know what I'm saying, to find some positivity out of it. And that's why players out there, you know what I'm saying, trying to get it together and trying to play, you know what I'm saying, just to find that positivity and give some hope to the rest of 2020 at this point. I love that. Uh, and then what do you think as a spectator this year? For the first time in I don't know how long, you're not going to be in pads, you're not going to be in a helmet, running around on the field, <laughs> scoring touchdowns, no touchdown celebrations. I mean, are you like... Are you going to teach your daughter football already? Are you going to have her drawing plays? Are you going to start getting <laughs> antsy in the back in the backyard? Are you going to take her out there and do some wide receiver drills? Like what what's going to be happening? Are you just going to be a dad, not watch TV and change diapers? I mean, tell me what your plan is this year. Nah, I gotta watch some football. You know what I'm saying? To change okay. diapers and being dad is going is already there regardless. <laughs> so you might as well add the football <laughs> to it. Um, nah, but this year I'm gonna do a lot of a lot of teaching. My girlfriend got a lot of questions, a lot of things she needs to understand. So as far as me being able to break down some defenses and tell her why people are doing what, <laughs> that that'd be an opportunity because I know I'd be doing the same thing sitting down. You know what I'm saying? I'm gonna be breaking things down and making sure I understand why players did this and why I'm doing it. I'm gonna make sure she understands and that little bit one understand and, and know some stuff too and want to yell I explain some things to her but I'm eager to watch it this year in all honesty um, my team of course you know what I'm saying with the, the new additions there and, and the under expectations there the Bucks of course you know what I'm saying Tom Brady's over there you get to see him on a different team along with Grant who people thought wasn't coming back but now it's back right. but you know they got a lot of great players over there um, I get to honestly sit down and really evaluate like you said this whole this whole interview my best friend Robert Woods you know what I'm saying like I never got the chance to really sit down and evaluate and just tell him what some things I can help him with or what some, some things that he's actually doing very well. You feel what I'm saying? Like, I get yeah. the opportunity to sit down and actually pay attention to him, pay attention to, you know what I'm saying, DK, Devon Kennard, and see, you know what I'm saying, the type of things he's doing. You know, to do this is his first year back in Arizona, and you now that's where he's from, so I know he's hyped about being back there. Yeah. So I'm eager to see that. And your, you know your, relationship, your relationship with Robert Woods, you're really tight. You guys are really tight, yeah. right? Yeah, I was his best so, man in his way. I mean, okay. Um, let's see. He's balling, okay, he catches a touchdown, great. But if you see him on TV, go across the middle and get some alligator, hand, alligator arms and lets the ball go through and thinks he's going to get hit and doesn't get hit or something like that, are you going to be texting him? Are you going to be talking trash to him on text Boy. or what? Ask Robert. Robert has that. He probably get a text before, the, before he even get back to, the, to his phone. Before that play is over, I would text him like, all right, Woody. <laughs> Like, yeah, bro, we seen him out like a uh, my guy. You're like, you got to get right. <laughs> it's the same thing. Great. If I send him what we friends for at the end of the day, like, if yeah. I say, if I see some some bad, like, hey, bro, we got to, hey, we probably got to fix that. <laughs> same thing with him. He see me on film, like, hey, Keys, like, like it was a couple of times he see me on film blocking where he was like, hey, Keys, come on, bro. You got to do better than yeah. that. You know what I'm saying? What, about, so what like, about on Hard Knocks? Have you seen him on Hard Knocks? No, yeah. I seen him in one clip. One clip where yeah, uh, no. he was messing around with the DBs. I don't think Woody like he don't like the videos like that. Yeah, he don't like he don't like to be on video yeah. like that. I was like, come on, Woody, you gotta be more out there. And I mean, his style is just total trash, so we don't want him on camera. <laughs> <laughs> we all about football. No, you know how Rob is. I know how he is. I know how he is. That's great. All right, go through. Last thing, we'll do uh, go through your AFC South predictions. You're a former Jaguar. What's Minshew like? I mean, is he everything he's cracked up to be? He's got that crazy mustache. He looks like just a total gunslinger. Like, I mean, sh shooting from the hip, kind of crazy dude. What, was he a great quarterback? Did you like playing with him? Minshew is a great guy. In all honesty, the mustache is terrible. And not tell him to his face. <laughs> I told him plenty of times. The mustache is terrible, but he's working it very well. He's a good guy. In all honesty, as far as his plan out there, I just feel like he's giving the opportunity that Jacksonville needs. You feel what I'm saying? Like, he knows his, 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 his reads and things like that. But then also, you know what I'm saying, he's very good with his feet. I ain't gonna lie to you. Like, I'm, I'm a big fan of quarterbacks who's good with their feet because there's a lot of opportunities where I miss mean, it's, it's the NFL. You feel what I'm saying? There's a lot of situations where you feel what I'm saying defense is gonna play the perfect defense. 
you feel what I'm saying, where you might get caught up as far as as receivers and therefore your quarterback got to run with his feet. You feel what I'm saying? There's been a lot of situations where you got to save us and that's one thing Minshew do. Yeah. He, he's, he's very... I don't even want to know what you want to call it, but he just he should be making people miss and just keeping the play, yeah. you know what I'm saying, going. And at the end of the day, that's what Jacksonville needs, somebody who's going to keep going and that different energy and, 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 and just energy they need in Jacksonville right now. They rocking with it, so I, I don't feel bad that they're they running with it. And then what about uh, you got the Colts, Phillip Rivers in his first year there with plenty to prove, and then another one of our fellow USC alumni, Michael Pittman Jr., over there in his rookie season. What do you think happens there? And what would you, what would you tell Michael Pittman Jr. if he was on the show right now? What would you tell him about his rookie year? Would you say just, you know, shut up, put your head down and work, or, you know, do every uh, potential endorsement you can, make the money while you can? <laughs> I mean, what kind, of, what kind of advice would you give him? I mean, I just feel like for him, it just the main thing as far as coming into the rookie is make sure you know yourself, a sense of your body and things like that. If you haven't learned it, you feel what I'm saying, coming out of college, it's your opportunity to really wire down and really learn yourself as a man, you feel what I'm saying, and really understand what... What, what you like, what your body like, and, and, and the things that you need in order to keep your body healthy. That was the main thing for me. I fought a lot of injuries once I hit the league and things like that. Um, but other than that, man, at the end of the day, you're a man. You feel what I'm saying? It's time to go out there and rock. And the coach is paying you for a reason. You feel what I'm saying? So at the end of the day, ain't nothing different than what he was doing in college. You feel what I'm saying? I'm hyped to see him play this year. And then on that, God bless you with the opportunity to get Philip Rivers out there. Like, you know what I'm saying? Oh, like, yeah. it's it's a blessing. You feel what I'm saying? Because everybody know Philip is a great quarterback. You feel what I'm saying? So Pittman is a great receiver along with T.Y. and things like that. So at the end of the day, they got the opportunity to go out there and go crazy. Like, I'm eager to see how that division go. Because yeah, the, and then the, just, the, the last Texas two. Is cool. Yeah, that's who I was going to ask you about. What's going on? Watson, I mean, can he get over the hump in the playoffs? He won a playoff game last year against the Bills, but is this the year? Do they make a deep run or do the Titans derail them? I mean, Man. can Tannehill make it happen two years in a row? I don't know what's going on with those two teams. Titans or Texans? Who do you like? Who goes farther? It's shaky, honestly. I got to see how that first game roll out. I want to see how, how good <laughs> uh, the Texas defense is. You know what I'm saying? I yeah. want to see where, how J.J. Watt come out and his energy because his energy basically controls the whole defense. And I know if he's rolling and rocking, you feel what I'm saying? They're going to be, I'm not worried oh, about yeah. Deshaun Watson. You feel what I'm saying? I'm not worried about him. I know he's going to go out there and go crazy. And you just got Brandon Cook, so that's another speech you're added to. Your weapons, yes, you lost a great receiver, don't get me wrong. Right. But you added somebody who's, who's I wouldn't, you added somebody who, see, who can get the job done too, you know what I'm saying, in all honesty. Uh, now, Hot That's probably great. got the best hands in the league, but you know what I'm saying, Cook ain't going to be too far off as far as just going out there, getting open to make sure you're making plays for Texas. That's great. Tennessee? I got to tell you, Keith. Oh, what's going to happen? Can Tannehill do it again? Is is Henry going to be rolling through people like that? I mean, the guy's a, a damn freight train. Nobody can bring him down. Listen, if they stay healthy, it's a problem. From Tannehill, yeah. you know, to Henry. It's just, I watched it in person when I was in Jacksonville, him running. People say, he ain't that fast. Like, no, nah, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a bulldozer coming fast. You feel what I'm saying? So everybody got the, the it's a good division this year. You feel what I'm saying? It's high hopes. You know what I'm saying? Not a little players and implements on teams and things like that. So I'm eager to see how that, how that, how that conference go and things like that. And you know, I'm still, part, you know what I'm saying, of Jacksonville in the sense of I know some of the uh, receivers, so therefore, if I see some crazy stuff with their receivers too, I'm going to text them and let them know, like, yo, I see that. <laughs> Let them know. <laughs> the good and it. the bad. That's great. Got to. Well, got you know to. what I got to say, Keith? One, great interview. I appreciate your time. Two, I appreciate that you keep up with football and know, like, different trades that have happened and who's on what team and kind of what you're expecting this year because I've asked these questions to people before and they're like, oh, he got traded? Oh, I didn't. Dang, that's crazy. And you're just like, all right, we're just going to cut this whole segment. Forget it. You know, so uh, I appreciate nah, that you keep up with the game. So much love and uh, positive, positive vibes to you and your family and especially your young daughter. Enjoy the season and uh, maybe we'll catch up Soon, let's uh, plug your socials. What are your social handles? Go ahead. They both just Team Lee One. Team Lee One, easy enough for us. Yeah. It's at Fourth and Forever on Instagram, 
Twitter, and then on YouTube as well, youtube.com slash fourth and forever. Thank you for tuning in for the interview with one of our favorite Trojans of all time, Mark Heasley. Thanks, buddy, for your time. Always. Appreciate you. Like, share, subscribe, uh, at Mark underscore Sanchez, at fourth and forever, Instagram, Twitter, all that. You know where to go. Thanks again for having us, and we'll see you soon.